how to find and close deals using B2B buying signals. Welcome back to a fresh episode of BreakingB2B.com. I'm your host, Sam Dunning. And if you want to join thousands of legends and join past podcast episodes, or to try out our daily B2B marketing tips, tips email head over to breakingb2b.com so today i'm joined by Sri swamanathan Sri is the ceo and co-founder over at factors ai we're gonna be diving into what the heck are buying signals when it comes to b2b and what is signal based selling we can talk about some of the signals that you as a b2b operator should be looking out for how you can work those into actually deals and speed up your pipeline some of the problems you might face and a bit of a step by step so with that Sri, welcome to the show how are you doing hi Sam? hi sam doing very very well and thanks for the great introduction happy to no be here. well good man looking forward to it so let's dive in as we always do first and foremost what is a buying signal and what does signal based selling actually mean well thanks a lot for asking that and let's let's look at it from a b to be buying journey, right? Uh, one, nobody buys B2B in a kind of, just say, let's say how you buy a B2C product. It's not something like a single person decision. There are multiple people involved in that decision. It's not bought instantly or on an impulse. It's like happens over multiple days, whether you're buying a CRM or whether you're buying a marketing automation tool or even a scheduling product or a account intelligence product or an ABM product. It's never like one person buying it and over just one day when you discover it and buy it. And lastly, it's also something where like the whole deal process takes multiple months in terms of like over a period of time and there is a stages and then there is expansion and there is a lot of discovery. There are multiple review sites and other this thing. And what B2B buying signals basically means is like ability to bring together all the signals which matter for a B2B buyer prospect journey and then taking actions around them. So these signals can be one top of the funnel, whether it's on Google ads or LinkedIn ads or any other ad channels. It can be organic signals where like which are the users coming from organic buttons or into your content, etc. It can be from people coming in from your social posts. Second, it can come into buying signals can be in the website, whether like who are the ones who are looking at your pricing page, who are the ones which are looking at your let's say your uh, case studies, who are the ones who are looking at your solutions page or your product features page or uh, log uh, change logs, which are there. And lastly, who are the ones which are opening up your emails, which are the, who are the ones who are replying to your emails, which is more, more of the marketing automation activity. And finally, in your CRM, in terms of like, what are the stage of the deals? Is it already in an ABM list? Is it in a prospect list? Is it in a close loss list? It is in a kind of like a NQL stage list, which is there. That's These are the buying signals across the board. And this, what I'm talking is just the first party data. Then comes the second party data, like Captera reviews, Trust Radius reviews, G2 review data, which is there. And then finally, the third party data, which is come kind of like, what is the intent data outside, which is there like Bambura and other the same. So B2B buying signals is data across all these areas, whether right from third party to second party to the first party, across over a period of time across over multiple users from a same company interacting with you or your uh, website or your uh, emails, etc., to make a decision to buy. And that's what it is all about. Appreciate the breakdown. Let's dive a bit deeper into first, second, and third party data. So you gave us quite a few examples on the first party, like it could be a Google ad, it could be a LinkedIn ad, organic search, someone checking out a blog post, showing up, someone checking out a pricing page, email open, et cetera. Um, so that's all first party. Second party, were you saying it's like G2 reviews and yes. similar? Yeah, G2 review data, which is where like, it's a company, uh, G2 is an external site, but it hosts uh, your reviews and you can actually subscribe to those reviews data or intelligence data from G2 as well. So G2 can also show about like, which are the companies which are looking at your competitor pages? Which are the companies which are looking at the category grid pages? Which are the ones which have seen your ads on G2, etc. That's alternatives or other things. That's important data as well. Got it. And then third party was? 
Bombora. Bombora is an intent data signal, which is there, which is basically which are the kind of companies which are looking for specific keywords in third party sites like Tech Target, etc. So, it. for example, like let's say someone is evaluating factors.ai. How do they get to evaluate? One, they might see us from a kind of a competitor search keyword ad, or they might see us from a direct website uh, identification or a high intent keyword ad like. Uh, customer journey analytics or attribution or specific keywords which we bid on multi-touch attribution, etc. Or they might see us on our LinkedIn ad where uh, our team puts up beautiful LinkedIn ads in terms of the buyer journey analytics and intelligence and signal-based selling which is there. Or they might see us on an organic LinkedIn post where our team continuously posts. Or they might come to our website through organic where they look at a kind of a case study or a ebook on buyer journeys or they would look at an ebook on LinkedIn ads, etc., and then they might uh, discover what our product does as well because they come in organically to a web page in a certain parts. Or they might also see us through one of the cold outbound emails or other emails which our teams would have sent. So email opens and other thing which is there. This is the first party data which is there. The second party data would be like they would also go into G2 uh, where they would look at directly at factors.a product page or they might look at any of our competitor pages and end up looking at us in some form. Or they might be looking at the grid of customer journey analytics grid, which has like at least 55 companies which are there in that grid so that they want to evaluate like which companies are there and then they come and look at us. Lastly, they would also might be looking at us in a totally a third party website, which is like a tech target or one of the medium articles on like, okay, what does account journey analytics means? What does the ABM analytics mean, etc. That's also there. So all these signals, all, all these touch points are signals. That is like the good part in B2B is nobody randomly checks out these things. I mean, for the life of me, I wouldn't ask anyone to just come directly into my factors.ai website just for the fun of it and saying I'm not Twitter or Netflix. But I am a B2B company which solves for a very particular problem for B2B say, uh, marketers and sales folks, which is that when they have a need, they would surely come into my website. Or when they have a need for a product like that, they'll surely check out me on G2. Or when they have a need for something like that, they would either organically come into my website or they would be shown some of the ads which is there. And we would be able to track across all these things, across the board. Got it. Cool. So that was going to be my next question. How can we, there's a lot to dissect there. How can we leverage all this data as B2B founder, B2B marketer to our advantage and actually start producing a sales pipeline that could eventually become demos, booked calls, revenue. Yeah, that's where the analytics comes. What we do is we layer the data one on top of the other. So for example, I we map the entire buyer journey right from uh, top of the funnel, Google ads or LinkedIn ads, all the way up to the Sierra, which is the map and stitch together the entire buyer journey data across the board, the first party level, which is there. Then we add the G2 data on top of that. And then we, on top of that, we also add the third party intent data, which is also there if it comes from any of the subscribe platforms, which is there. Now you have all the data one on top of the other, which is there. Now you can slice and dice it, which is, for example, if I am a founder and as as part of my marketing plan or my sales plan, I would have a list of accounts, which is the top 150 accounts, which are my must have accounts as acquisitions for this year, which is there. And I would surface up to say that we can surface up like if any of these companies either have seen our G2 page or have come to my website pricing page or have seen my LinkedIn ad or have are looking for specific keywords account, around account journey analytics, etc. that needs to be highlighted. That's one way to look at for a founder. So when something like that happens, I immediately get a Slack alert to say that, okay, this company, which is part of your ABM target list is now visiting your pricing page. Do you want to take any action item? That's one way to surface up the signal when something like that happens. As a B2B marketer, who's my team, uh, Ajay is working on it. He would start getting lists around like, okay, these are the list of companies which have looked at over the last three months, have looked at your pricing page and G2 alternatives page and have also seen your LinkedIn ad. If you retarget, your campaigns to these companies, the higher chances of conversion are there. So that's something which the B2B marketer would look at. Third is like there'd be a list for my sales team, which is sales executive, which is that these are the companies which are in your ABM prospect list, which have also seen your pricing page five times in the last two weeks. 
And they have also looked at a competitor comparison page on your website as well, or a competitor comparison page or an alternative page on your G2, which means they are one, have intent to buy. They are also looking forward to a product. They are also showing interest from the pricing page. They are brand aware. Why don't you need to reach out to them either over a cold email or cold call so that you can convert them? So this is how, whether as a founder, what kind of alerts I would need versus as a marketer, what kind of lists which I need to retarget or as a salesperson, like which kind of companies I need to send outbound to, all of them come together based on these signals. Nice. So is this primarily useful for companies that have a, a list of top accounts, usually doing ABM, i.e. like you mentioned their top 50 accounts or there other scenarios where it can be useful too? So fundamentally, my belief around ABM is ABM is more than just a, it's not a tool. It's definitely a strategy or a philosophy where like every single B2B company is doing ABM. Whether and any company which is beyond product market fit where they are out, out of the first 10 or 20 design partners, they have a very clear list of companies they want to reach out. To. And this is what I call as the signal addressable market, which is there. So you have a TAM, which is the total addressable market, which can be like any company which is there in your ICP. It can be something like all SaaS companies, which are more than 50 employees, which are based in these set of geographies and also have Salesforce or HubSpot as CRM is the total addressable market. That would be almost like 50,000 companies which are there. I mean, but you're not going to try to sell to all 50,000 companies or try to market to all 50,000 companies, right? But from that list of 50,000, I have this list of 500 companies or 100 companies to which I want to sell a product which is $10,000 so, so that I reach my first million dollars which is there and this is the kind of and within that 100 companies which I want to look at I want to make sure that I reach out to the companies which are already aware of me in some form whether they have visited my website or seen my ad or aware of the category or the problem which is where they have either looked at a specific category the same category on G2 or something or at least aware of the problem where they have looked at third party sites around this thing. Only when these things come together, it's easy for me to sell to them. Otherwise, I'd be just trying to waste all my time in and my energy into set of accounts which are neither solution aware nor brand aware nor have a need at any point in time. And that's the foremost thing about the signal. It's like a company which is looking at your pricing page is far more high signal than a company which is just looking at your about us page once in every three months. Yeah, 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 makes sense. Les, you gave us some nice examples just now. So you said if you're a founder, you can set up signals. So if someone's actually from your account list, and maybe, for example, checks out your pricing page, then you might want to, what was it you, you said would be the best play in that case? So there are a couple of playbooks which are, once you have the signal, there are multiple playbooks which come into action. Just something like once you know you have the ball, you can either uh, kind of throw it, kick it, or do what you want with it. But as the founder, how it would uh, identify for me is scream at me is like, for example, like this is a company which is similar to two other of your existing customers, but they are a much larger player in the market. They also have the same stack, which you generally sell to. And they have been looking at your pricing pages a couple of times. And this is a company which you want to have as part of your ABM list that you want to market to and now they are in your pricing page or some other other thing. Once suddenly as soon as this comes into alert as a real-time alert for me, one, I can immediately send a LinkedIn uh, connect or a LinkedIn email to the bio personas in that account. That's one thing I can do. Second is I can automate an email to them saying that, hey, Sri here, founder at factors.ai, I saw there was some interest from your company on our website. Uh, this is what we do. Would you be interested in having a more detailed chat around this? Which is said. Third, I can also make sure that I push them into a LinkedIn audience and show LinkedIn ads to the key buyer personas within that company. It's not even if the person who might have come would be one person either in the marketing team or the sales team, which is there. I want to make sure that I talk to the entire buying committee because that's when it's like it's not just it's never going to be one person deciding it's the whole buying committee. I want to get in front of them and then convert them. So there are both uh, immediate uh, connection or a, say a LinkedIn kind of a activation uh, workflow, which is there. Second, there can always be an email workflow or a cold call or a cold email, a cold call workflow, which is there. Third, more importantly, there can also be a kind of a, a nice nudge uh, workflow with through LinkedIn ads and other points of view, which can also happen. Gotcha. And then the marketing example. 
the marketing example is a lot more uh, kind of detail oriented so marketing is all marketers and specifically b2b marketers in a fundamental level they want to target a certain list of companies which have certain properties and for each of those companies with certain properties they tweak the campaign they tweak the messages they tweak the creatives which is that and even the channels on which they do so for example a company which has just seen a linkedin ad but not taken any other action would be a list of like these are the companies which are totally on top of the funnel and they have also been on my just my linkedin ad nothing more than that they've just seen my once or couple of times in the thing let me take that list of companies and then do another retargeting campaign to them saying that hey this is something which is the new things which have happened to me that's one update which is said second is for a company where they can say like has seen our linkedin ad has also been to our pricing page one month back etc and they have also looked at my g2 page which is there now i create a totally different kind of a creative where like i put a g2 like where like oh, we are the spring quarter uh, momentum leaders etc i can take the creative and say like hey do you want to check out why 100 plus customers or 250 plus customers use factors dot ai and uh, or similar customers use factors dot ai and this thing and this is what it is and then they can craft another campaign for them that is they can create a list of companies which do these three actions create a list and then target specific ads for them third is like they can also look at companies which have come from google search and not convert which is a very very low hanging fruit which is like for example if you spend 100 clicks on google search keywords which is like let's say your competitor keyword your alternative keyword or even your high intent keywords barely four or five of them convert what happens to the remaining 95 clicks which you have paid for because each click is like at least 15 to 20 dollars and nobody randomly searches for a particular high intent keyword sorry something like factors.ai keyword or factors.ai competitor keyword name keyword comes all the way to factors.ai website and not convert so if we we will be able to identify which companies are these 95 companies and they have come from which keyword now you create a cohorted list and then do a retargeting campaign to them saying that hey we saw you had shown some interest on our website or this is what we do why do you want to do it so that's a more of a low hanging fruit for the marketer to then go and convert similarly there can be so many other slices and dices within this for example there is a old close loss account which you identify from the crm which is totally close loss or churn loss which is there those companies are now coming back and checking out your pricing page so whatever reason they weren't able to buy at that point in time or churned at that point in time now they are coming and showing interest on your pricing page you go back to them with a totally different campaign so what it helps is like for marketers the actually the equation becomes much bigger because he fundamentally relishes to target to multiple people over multiple campaigns and creators and channels and he can create different kind of creators and uh, channels based on each and every hypothesis he wants to build on mm there's a lot of different ways you could take that i'm sure like you mentioned yeah. there as and, as you were going through that it gave me some ideas yeah and all this is based on all these signals coming from multiple points either there is a g2 signal or there is a website signal or a google ad signal or there is a crm signal whether the account is churned or closed lost or mql no show so many things uh, mm. demo no show accounts you can push it into a different kind of a sequence uh, a kind of a closed lost account is a different sequence totally new uh, not in my abm list but fits my icp criteria will be a totally different sequence gotcha or like not in the uh, kind of geography which i serve but it's a totally different geography but fits my icp criteria i can then start even doing a different language uh, kind of a creative and then push it across so for a marketer when he actually identifies these signals and he has the ability to create audiences or segments from all these lists the options become like uh, one in many for him to actually then start activating him and making sure at a fundamental level he's targeting the right set of accounts with the right kind of messages and most importantly he actually doesn't spend too much and he throw no spray and pray where like he just takes the same set of accounts and runs the same set of campaigns for each of the segments of those accounts he can set different campaigns to run and convert better as he wants so his marketing roi improves and that's a huge benefit for the marketer yeah 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 some nice examples is this primary a linkedin ads play from the marketing point of view or is there email involved that you tend to work in as well uh email is here it's there's an email marketing play as well so for example old demo no show accounts or mql trial but after trial doesn't happen you want to put it into an email play as well it's like you had seen our demo or you didn't see our demo you had signed up in the past now we are showing interest back again do you want to just check out for another demo please i'll send over a calendar so that you can book a, book a time with us 
or you can also put it into an ad sequence. You can also use it, push it back into your Google Ads retargeting, or you can push it back into your ABM retargeting, programmatic ads, where like, you can say this set of accounts and this cohort is what works for this thing. Let me push it into my sixth sense to run ads for them. Gotcha. That's founder, that's marketing. Lastly, give us a, a couple of examples further on, on the salesperson's point of view, Sri. Sales is something which is where, which becomes very exciting for the sales guy because it's deal acceleration at a fundamental level. And there can be two, three use cases which are there. One is like, I know an account which, let's say I'm totally a cold or bond SDR, which is there. So, or like I'm a full cycle where like I have to suppose to bring in deals and then convert them. And I have so much time per day, I can't go after every single account which is there in the market. But I find this account which I want to go after, which or which is part of my account list or a, a, a territory list for me to go and target to. This account has seen me on G2 competitor or alternative page. And uh, it's also uh, seen my LinkedIn ad, which my marketing team has been running consistent LinkedIn ads or always on LinkedIn ads, which is there. And they've also visited my website once. So I know they are already brand aware. If I do a cold call to the buyer person out there, it's not going to be a totally like unknown play. It's not going to be like, who are you? He is actually going to recognize my brand and then talk. So can I do a cold ca a call campaign to them or do a cold email campaign to them or even a LinkedIn sales nav message so that I can go and uh, convert them? That becomes a huge superpower for the AE because he wants to get as many deals as possible or as many demos as possible so he can start nurturing them. He doesn't want to talk to everyone in the world and waste his energy with us there. That's one thing. Second workflow, which actually happens there is like, as any sales guy, he wants to do more of strategic selling, building the business case, why the ROI matters. He doesn't want to do the grunt work of like identifying the account, identifying the buyer persona within that account, getting their email IDs, and then starting to send like a sequence of emails and other things. Some parts of this can be really, really automated. Even the Dripify workflow or a sales nav workflow, which is that can be automated with the product with the account intelligence plus a zapier or a make.com kind of workflow you can aut automate all these workflows which is there so that the salesperson actually focuses on real selling and relationship mm -hmm. building rather than just kind of any other kind of other thing third is also is like even for existing deals i set up a demo the mql is also there i want to know what he's actually interested in. which case studies is he reading how much time he's spending on pricing page? How much time is spending on my G2 page? How much time is spending on some other page? So that I will know what is the pitch I have to do. I will also know what's his intent. It's more like a hunting instinct builder. So for example, you know someone who's coming here having this thing, you know what kind of arrow to use, you know what kind of feeder. You can say like, we are the most price efficient in the market, or you don't need to even talk about pricing, but you can talk about why you are better than some other competitor, or you just want to take through a particular case study where like a some client use factors.ai as a product and generated 20% extra pipeline in this quarter so that you can build on a value cell basis and then want to do. That's real intelligence. And you'll also know how many users from that particular account are looking at your website and other thing. And that's some intelligence which a salesperson can use. That's one way where like service. Even another one where AEs use our product is a deal has an MQL and no deals closes within like 15 days or seven days. It's like uh, 45 days to a two month kind of life cycle. They are on a trial and other the same. During the trial process, they come and check out your pricing page. They come and check out a specific case study page. When something like that happens, getting an immediate slack alert for the AE, he will know like this company is on trial. I know it's a high ended lead. It's let's say a $15,000 ACV or a $20,000 ACV. Lead. Now they are checking out my pricing page as they're going through the trial. Let me send a WhatsApp message or a LinkedIn message to them, like, hey, uh, how's the trial going? Is this something where we can help with? And if there is any kind of discussions where we can go further because he knows that he's on the website he's looking at pricing page he knows that they are actually intent who's the person who's actually intent on that particular page as well he will know because it's an already a known lead which is there but he can nudge them to accelerate the lead this is a deal acceleration so that instead of the deal closing in six weeks you can make them close in four weeks which means for a salesperson instead of closing nine deals a year he can actually close 12 to 13 deals a year it's a huge benefit which is there a lot of use cases. I like it. One thing that springs to mind, Shri, is there's, so we've talked about how a founder, a marketer, and a salesperson could use uh, signals when it comes to, to B2B. But how do you prioritize and make sure that folks within your organization aren't stepping on each other's toes? I maybe the marketers like doing a bunch of retargeting ads because they're like, we've got these hot prospects that dropped off after Google ads and didn't convert. And then at the same time, the A is like, 
no, nah, I'm just going to give them a cold call and I'm going to get them on for a demo. But the market's like, no, then we need to serve them ads first to warm them up a bit more and build a bit more trust. Then they're going to be ready for a call. Like, what's that balance? Is there one or is that like more, more judgment or how does that work? So one thing is like for everyone has the customer journey in hand in real time. Whether the salesperson, when he's going after a lead, he's also going to see that whether they are seeing the ads, whether they are seeing that email or the cold call, the marketer also knows like which are the companies where all those actu activities happen. And it's a real time audience building. So for the marketer, he will know like he will create an audience based on only companies who have done X, Y, Z and not reached out in other ways. Because he gets the CRM data also in place in sync. He gets the G2 data also in sync. He also gets the website activity data on sync. And then only he builds an audience. So marketer is not going to generally show ads to people who are already in advanced stages of conversation. Similarly, the sales guy is also not going to call someone else who hasn't been actually shown multiple ads beyond a certain level, which is there. So the signals and the counting, which is fully done as an analytics platform is everything is very, very clear. That's there. The second part is to an extent in marketing, there's always a need of multiple touch point and there is a surround sound effect. That is like if the sales guy is trying to reach out to an account and trying to talk to the account, if the same account has also has had, let's say, a Instagram ad and also a LinkedIn ad and also multiple, let's say, emails or something of that sort, it adds to the surround zone where like we get on top of their mind so that it's kind of in a sense like it's already very good brand and solution aware where they know what's getting. So in a sense, what we call about in from a military terminology is like sales team is more like infantry trying to go and do very specific targeting and talking to people while the marketing gives the air cover across multiple points so that they actually be making it more easier for them to sell better. And that works much better. Any, appreciate the breakdown. Any examples of how signal-based selling for B2B compares to more traditional formats, i.e., let's say, just running single channels, be it LinkedIn lead gen campaigns as a one-off channel, Google ads as a one-off channel, um, could be organic search as a one-off channel, and then maybe likewise, you've got your sales team just doing cold, hard outbound to target B2B accounts. Like, is there use cases where you've done this, where you are doing this as a strategy because that's what your tool works around, but compared to kind of, I, I guess, siloed strategies, like the amount of pipeline there is to scoop up, any examples? So the siloed strategy, it, I mean, uh, I have a view that silo strategy is going to be dead in the next couple of years. There's not going to be any silo strategy. ABM doesn't fall over silo strategy for B2B marketing. Uh, the fundamental reason behind this is like, Earlier, one, there weren't so many data signals available in the first place. So you just had like email data was in a silo, sales happened in a certain silo. Stitching that back into the marketing data, stitching that back into your review data, stitching that what the customers are doing in multiple other places was not available. So for example, you had a G2S, G2 crowd originally, which was just a review site, which had reviews. They had a platform which sold reviews. So if I go and check out G2 reviews or G2 other pages, I wouldn't know at all. Second is like what was happening on LinkedIn, which companies were viewing your LinkedIn ads was totally unknown. LinkedIn didn't share that data. You were just able to see if anyone clicked and then submitted the form on LinkedIn, came back to your website with the email ID and other things. Otherwise, you wouldn't know about it. Now you would be able to see which companies are just seeing your LinkedIn ads. Third, the technology for in terms of identifying which companies are coming to your website anonymously. That wasn't fully developed. There was a little bit of IPD anonymization. Now you have a far better data around that. Fourth, the whole email activity data, which is like, and also the CRM active data, who's opening your emails, who's seeing your emails, who's clicking on those links, etc., was also a separate silo, which is there. Now, one, there has been a B2B is following B2C in terms of signals from multiple points. And fourth, there is also one more thing, which is product activity data, which is like, who are the ones who are setting up a trial? Who are the ones who are actually using your freemium product very well? and other the things, so which is a product level event data, which is there, that was also not uh, missing totally. Now we are able to pull together all the data, seamlessly stitch them together as an entire buyer journey, and then create cohorts and other parts out of it. This is basically like a matter of like one where you are able to, uh, there are APIs available for you to bring together the data. There is an analytics platforms where you can build around this data and create cohorts and segments. Now that's available. 
Second part is even if you are able to do that, earlier times it used to be like maybe 100 accounts there, 50 accounts there. ABM marketing was generally a more of an enterprise game which was there. Now as more and more SaaS companies play and also the, given the kind of competition and the amount of data which is coming in, this more or less becomes more similar to a B2C game where you need proper analytics and other tools. You need AI to actually identify signals which matter, score them and then build around that, build cohorts and audiences around that. So that becomes a very, very clear need. And lastly, as more competition comes in, as more generally there'll be a lot of noise in front of the customer, you need to be on top of the customer. The sales game needs to be advanced. It's something like instead of fighting with bows and arrows or on camels, you eventually get into a lot of artillery and you get into bombers and other this thing. It's an evolution of the whole sales game. So the wars remain the same, but it's more like you just advance. The technology just makes you far more advanced in terms of how you want to run it. I like the analogies and I can get a feel that as a founder, you're someone that's been on the sales side. So I speak to a lot of marketers, but a lot of marketers haven't been on the, the cold, harsh front of selling to other founders, marketers and businesses. But I get the feeling that you've done all, all angles of this. I mean, uh, the, as any startup and other, the same founders start with selling. So there is a and how you can do selling better. And this is one of our own journeys has come into understanding signal-based selling is from our own journey of how difficult it was to sell and how difficult it was to feel the pain of losing money in a lot of marketing, but not able to make that out. So for example, we were knowing our Google search ads were hitting a good target, but we didn't know apart from the two or three person who converted, who are the rest of the people who are showing intent on our Google search because all Google analytics will give us like number of visitors from paid search, that's all. Who are the visitors? What were they doing? How much time they were spending? Can I segment this and retarget them? Can I segment this and call them up? Can I segment this and reach out to them? That was totally missing. Similarly, we used to spend a lot on LinkedIn ads. And then we became a LinkedIn partner. LinkedIn was able to give us like which companies were exactly seeing your LinkedIn ads, how many times they were seen. And then we were able to build the whole entire journey to then go back to companies to say that, or even our own sales, uh, we started dog footing our own product to say like, okay, these companies are doing X, Y, Z. Let me reach out to them and convert them to sales. These companies are doing why, and they're not aware of the other parts. Let me actually reach out to them. This company, which I'm talking to now, or already demo, uh, done a demo two weeks back, is now checking out my pricing page. Let me reach out and convert them mm. as soon as possible. All this became, the signals became more and more, and it becomes intoxicating as well, because now you know, like there are so much data available. There is also these signals. Let me actually, use these signals in terms of kind of direct selling points. I just say. So we've talked through a lot of the use cases, examples and advantages, but for anyone that wants to start getting B2B signals rolling for their SaaS or tech company, can you perhaps share a DIY example, Shri, of how you could do this on a very basic level if you just want to dip your toe in the water and start using it and mm -hmm. then a more advanced example, which I'm guessing is using a tool like your own at Factors. So at a very basic level, if you want to just get started with any uh, uh, kind of signal-based selling is like, at a very basic level, you can just take uh, any of the visitor identification tools, which is account de-anonymization tools. You have Clearbit, you have Factors.ai, you have uh, Lead Feeder, you have a couple of others which are there in the market, which like, you just want to know which companies are visiting your website. Let's say if I'm a a uh, kind of an early stage founder. I have 10 or 15 design partners. I've just set up my website. I've started writing some blogs and other things. So I have started getting a little more than 600 to 1000 visitors on a monthly basis. That's 30, 40 visitors on my monthly basis. One thing which is safe for me to assume is like nobody randomly visits my web page. If someone is coming in reading my blog, he's someone who has actually searched for this kind of a problem, which is cloud optimization or cloud security or pen testing, any of the problems which he's searching for, he searched for my blog, uh, Google has ranked it uh, on a certain list and then they are coming to my website. I need to know who's coming in visiting my website. So that's the basic level of getting started with signal-based selling. And second part is like, if you have an analytics and then on top of that, you can do a Google analytics plus kind of visitor identification or general, uh, something like an account level analytics tool, like factors that to say like, which of these companies are spending time on my website? Who are the ones who are spending more than 20 seconds? Who are the ones who are spending more than a minute? 
who are the ones who are bouncing off after two seconds. So then you can filter out like this company is now scrolled 70% on this blog and spent five, five seconds. And when something like that happens, the first level you can do is like use something like Slack for that token. Either use make it uh, happen with a make.com or something, or you can use a tool also which gives free versions to bring a Slack alert whenever some company which spends more than 10 seconds on your pricing page or your blog gets alerted for you. This is the basic part of signal-based selling. That is just using your website data, which is complete first-party data. I'm not asking to link to any ad channels. I'm not asking companies to even start spending on ads. I'm not asking for any link to CRM. Just website-based intent. How do you convert your website-based intent to some form of sales signal? Then you know which companies you want to reach out to. Once you know which companies you want to reach out, you'll automatically know that, okay, in these companies, this is my buyer persona. Then I can reach out either over LinkedIn or I can reach out over a cold email, etc. That's secondary, but at a first level is using your website level intent data, which is one way to get started. Nice. So is this there, is the is there like a base, before you ramp it up, I appreciate the breakdown, is, before you ramp it up, is there a baseline of traffic that your website should be getting roughly before you look to do this strategy? I would say one more than a baseline traffic at what stage is your company? Mm. It's your company beyond the design partner stage. I wouldn't say product market fit. Is your company at a very basic level above the design partner stage? The thing. Because if it is in the uh, design partner stage, you would want to get only known and kind of companies which are willing to invest time with working with someone like you to build the product. But once it's above the design partner stage, you want to get anonymous customers. And that's when, when you, you... Yeah, sorry. When you say design partner, that means... Yeah, when, when you say design partner, Shri, I've not heard of that term actually before. What does that mean? So design partner is like when uh, you start up and this thing, your first 20 customers are your design partners. Uh, I see, as in you're building it for your customers. Building it Got for it. your customers, you're building it with your customers, you're building it with active feedback from your customers at a product time. Which is at that point in time, you don't need any kind of intent-based selling. But once you're past that, you have a certain amount of website traffic, which is at least more than 1,000 per month just 30 visitors per day, which is pretty less. You have a couple of blogs explaining what your product does. You have an active working website, which is there. You talk about something like, okay, the problem and the solution very, very clearly in a very clear articulate fashion saying that this is the problem. This is where, this is a solution. This is where our product comes very clearly. If you're able to articulate that, then people will come and read about it. You're able to put some case studies. You're able to uh, kind of articulate your uh, kind of uh, the ROI or the business use case of your product very, very clearly. Then there is organic traffic which can come into your website. That's when you can get started with the whole signal-based selling in the first place. Before that, it's no signal-based selling. It's more like, uh, do you have this problem? I'm trying to solve this problem and also discover whether this problem is important or not. Mm. That kind of thing. I like it. I like it. And then I'm guessing once you feel that you've mastered that sort of thing, so maybe you're pushing the boundaries of this perhaps DIY setup that you've got with your own visitor, visitor identification, then maybe uh, you've got some tools that are sending you notifications in Slack, and then you're maybe trying to retarget those folks with LinkedIn ads, maybe doing a bit of email yeah. outreach once you when feel you that's marketing. hitting its limits. Yeah, when you start marketing at a fundamental level, that's when you see like, okay, I can't just wait for organic people to sign up or other thing. I have to start marketing. I have to start bidding on competitors. I have to start bidding on high intent keywords which is Google search is the first start, which is that second is the LinkedIn ads. If you feel your audience is available on LinkedIn, how do I showcase to them? How do I create to them and other the thing? That's where the thing, and you also have a proper CR where like something like a HubSpot or something like this thing where you are not, you have enough and more clients where you want to move beyond an ad table list, which is that. Cool, man. Appreciate, yeah. appreciate the breakdown. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you believe that marketers tuning in should be aware of perhaps any problems or hurdles that they might face anything else you feel that that we should uh, include before we wrap things up one thing which is very very highly misunderstood is linkedin ads uh, linkedin ads have very low conversion rates and most marketers especially in b2b start running linkedin ads and after some time uh, they strongly feel about linkedin ads should work because uh, LinkedIn is a proper B2B social network. Whoever is there on LinkedIn is there to share notes about what he's 
doing or more importantly showcase his uh, professional profile and also learn from peers which is he's there for a b2b notion he's not like it's not like instagram for him very very clearly and so the audience is very clearly there on uh, linkedin linkedin is also more than a 1 billion user community so it's like 1 billion plus professional community predominantly english speaking which is there which is like a huge world almost one sixth of the world which is there for you there so linkedin ads obviously works but the thing is or they know that their audience is there they want to advertise it but when marketers approach linkedin ads they try to compare it with google ads hmm. google ads is a high search intent ad you search for something and you go and immediately click and then you convert for a sign up so conversion rates will be 2 to 3% linkedin ads conversion rates are less than half a percent or much worse than that that's one point number one which marketers need to update the second thing is people see linkedin ads like how you see a billboard ad you see a billboard of iphone 15 you don't buy immediately from a billboard it's like okay this iphone 15 billboard is good let me go back home after a couple of weeks you feel your iphone 12 is not charging enough you need to upgrade to an iphone 15 then you look for some offers or bank discounts or something like that on amazon or something do a google search and then you go and convert the last click attribution will be there for the google search but the initiator would have been the billboard which is there same thing happens in linkedin ads you see people see linkedin ads they don't immediately submit a form there maybe half a percent or less than half a percent of them do but remaining 99% of them would always see that linkedin ad they would also maybe sometimes later come organically into your website or through a paid search come to our website tracking this is something which we can do now as factors.ai because we are linkedin marketing partners but this is something which most marketers don't realize they see like okay linkedin ads they they spend 5 to 10000 dollars on linkedin ads and then they feel like okay linkedin ads doesn't give enough conversions compared to like google ads so they mm -hmm. stop spending on linkedin ads until much later when they uh, figure out but linkedin ads actually contributes a good amount of organic and paid search visits and that's something which gets missed out, which is very very clearly the last thing which also happens on linkedin ads is like how do you spread out the campaign and how do you make the campaign work for example like uh, linkedin being a social network it optimizes for getting to the maximum audience possible in the least amount of time which is possible which is there which means when you do let's say when you target 100 companies 10 to 20 of those companies will end up seeing 80 to 90 percent of your ads so there is a pareto which happens there where like you might end up showing a lot of ads to a one company while very few ads to another company which is there how do you spread it out is a part of science and how do you cap the frequency how do you run the campaigns correctly which is there which gets generally missed so companies will be like spending ten thousand dollars of which close to five thousand dollars will be spent to one or two companies and this is a waste waste of budget then they'll be complaining okay the leads didn't come through it wouldn't obviously come through if you if there is so much exposure to one or two companies and not for the rest of the companies which is there so all these nuances are there within linkedin ads which is something which b2b marketers are not aware and what happens because of it they either spend too much on google search or they go and put a lot of money into programmatic ads which is there which is has its own issues around fraud and publisher uh, listing and other this thing they miss out on the gold line which can be linkedin ads which if done properly can result in a lot of uh, results uh, i mean a lot of pipeline which is there which can mm. yeah i i see that i agree i think not that i'm i'm by far a LinkedIn ads expert, but we've had folks who I think you know as well, Justin Rowe from Impactable. Yeah. We've had him on the show nice. twice. Um, so he he did a LinkedIn ads masterclass, then he came back to do a LinkedIn thought leader ads masterclass where you can yeah, push yeah. ads through the through the personal profiles. Are you guys doing that much, pushing ads through personal profiles? Are you sticking to the company brand for ads at the moment? We do uh, organic uh, personal, uh, personal profile posts are also something which we are trying, but we tend to keep it more organic then keep it as promoted uh we are and while company profiles come directly as ad but uh, justin rowe and quite a few others are now starting to create this whole i mean it's happened in the last 12 months if you actually see the chronology where people b2b marketers are waking up to how to use linkedin ads better earlier it was more of an enterprise game others were using it this thing now it's becoming a more democratized game where like multiple companies are starting to use linkedin ads very very clearly and using multiple other thing and linkedin as a platform is also listening to feedback where they are making more and more options available to marketers to start running ads better and uh, it's all for the good where like it's a very good platform which you can run on in multiple levels uh, which linkedin would be what facebook is for b2c yeah sure 
Really appreciate the the breakdown. You clearly have a, a solid knowledge on all things B2B signals, but not just that, the, the B2B buying journey, the marketing side of things, the selling side of things. So I appreciate you sharing practical examples as well as your own insights from growing your business with us today. So with that, please do tell us more about how everyone tuning in can learn more from yourself and how they can get in touch for Factors. Uh, one is like, of course, uh, Factors Today website is there. We have an academy and a YouTube channel uh, very clearly. Second is most importantly, we are fully active on LinkedIn. So myself and the whole founding team and our sales team and others from our marketing are very active on LinkedIn. We believe strongly around LinkedIn social selling, which is basically like putting up, putting ourselves in front of our audience and LinkedIn, asking for feedback, talking about our product, talking about the insights which we gather, talking about our doubts and other thing very, very clearly. So the best way to immediately interact with us is through our LinkedIn profiles. So that's it. Awesome, man. Luxury. Really appreciate the chat. Thanks for coming on the show. Sure. Thanks a lot, Sam. Really enjoyed your conversation. And it also helped me articulate a lot of my points in a structured way. Thanks a lot for that. No worries, man. Got to give a big shout out, not just to Factors, but also Revenue Hero, our partners for the show. And a big thank you to the audience. And if you want to join thousands of legends enjoying past episodes or to try out our daily newsletter, head over to breakingb2b.com. And with that, we should catch you on the next one for more no BS B2B tips to grow your business and grow your revenue. Cheers for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sam.